Hello everyone, my name is Paul Taylor and I'm the director of the HBO documentary, The Art of Political Murder. Um, today I have uh, the real pleasure of uh, chatting with three um, very special guests, three people that played integral roles in helping um, bring this film to life and um, were critical in the Haradi case. Um, so thank you everyone for being a part of this. Um, so let's start off by having you introduce yourself and talk about your role during this case. Um, so Arturo, tell us about your role in this case and how did you come to work for the Catholic Church's Human Rights Office? Well, thank you, Paul. Pleasure being here. Well, my name is Arturo Aguilar. I'm Guatemalan. I'm a human rights defender. I'm a lawyer by training and um, I worked for the Catholic Church. I started working for the Catholic Church when I was 18. That was my first real job. And I started as a volunteer um, working for um, the Human Rights Office of the Catholic Church, actually. And I must say that it was the most profound and best school I could ever wish for. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Claudia, tell us about your role covering this case um, and how you came to become a journalist. Hi all, thank you for having me here. Um, Claudia Mendez Arriaza, I'm a Guatemalan. And when I was 21 years old, I was hired by El Periodico to become a courts reporter. And that's how I came to report on this case. At the beginning, I wasn't sure to take a, such a complex process. It was a lot of words and a lot of you know, faces which I didn't understand. So I started covering the case very um, shyly. And then I became uh, engaged with the case. And um, years have passed. And I can say that as I was growing as a reporter, I was reporting this case. It became like an obsession to me, like a drug. I was addicted to it, to know more about it and to learn who was behind every move and to understand what was going on in the case. Thank you. And, and Frank, tell us how, um, introduce yourself and tell us how you came to write this book. Um, I'm Francisco Goldman. Uh, I'm a fiction writer and journalist. It's, uh, I, my family's Guatemalan on my mother's side. Um, you know, the way this started was uh, I, I had uh, covered Central America as a journalist in the 80s, but for the 90s, I was basically working on fiction. I, I, I thought I was sort of done, but then the Bishop Harari case happened, and by a kind of strange circumstance, uh, I found myself in, in Guatemala for the New Yorker in 1998 doing a story on the Bishop Harati murder. I thought it was going to be just one story, one, you know, uh, for the magazine. And like Claudia, uh, I met the people who were involved. I became completely hooked on the case. It was a nine-year obsession that I had the incredible pleasure of uh, sharing with both Arturo and Claudia. Um, and and, and it, it turned into a book. Uh, I should say quickly, it could, it, you know, you had to really wait because it couldn't become a book till we knew we were actually going to win the case. And that didn't happen till 2007, when finally the final appeal was upheld. And I remember getting the email from Arturo, we won, we won. And that's when I knew I had to write the book. Fantastic. And so obviously you became, you all became very good friends through the course of the writing of the book, but Arturo, when uh, Francisco first showed up in Guatemala, what was your first impression of him and what he told you he wanted to do? And what did, did you wonder why, why he wanted to follow you around? Uh, do we get to be like honest in this interview or yeah. is it like a more... Uh, I, I have my version. One. Yeah. That should be. No, no, no. Um, no, it was uh, it was great chemistry from the beginning. Um, we had been working for several months uh, by that time uh, uh, in the case, and um, it was pretty clear for us that we needed to um, be able to gain as most allies as we could in order to be able to win this case. Not only on the judicial part, but on the symbolic and on the narrative part as well. So Francisco being, by that time, 
still a, a, a famous writer. So we thought, or I thought, it could, this could be great. And in the process of getting to know each other, um, I just, I, I, I pride myself of having a really good sense to understand uh, the essence of people. And I knew he was a good guy. I knew he was a great guy. And I knew from day one, he was going to be committed to this case because this case ne needs commitment. Um, so we're working on the case when it happened, the day it happened, and, and, and I worked for 10 years till the day that Francisco mentioned just earlier, um, the day that the Supreme Court upheld uh, the, the conviction um, in this case. So that was 10 years. Um, and I know he was in it for the long run. And I, oh, before I read his book, right? Um, and I thought he has the brains and the sensibility to write this story uh, and in, the, in the way that it needs to be told. So it was great. It was great having seen And of course, then we became friends for sure. But it was good. It was good from day one. Excellent. Um, so you all saw the film recently. Um, Claudia, what was it like watching it for the first time and looking back on this case after 20 years? Well, it moved me. I have to tell you this because it's totally different to see, you know, uh, in 90 minutes, a whole story and the meaning of the story for all of us and to revisit the past with the, the lens that I have now, um, more mature, I understand more and more uh, the complexity of the story. Uh, the other day I was talking to one of the investigators and um, after talking with him, I came to the conclusion, well, this was a magnicide actually. Uh, it was a magnicide with all its complexity and <clears throat> It was for me, after watching the 90 minutes uh, with my family, I realized that they, their comments uh, were new to me. And then I understood that uh, they were understanding things in the present that were not as clear in the past. I think, in different ways that happened to me as well. Mm -hmm. um, and Arturo, what was it like for you watching the film as well? I mean, you were so young when this case happened, you were 19 years old at the time. What was it like uh, watching the film and reflecting back on this time in your life? Um, actually, it's very interesting. Um, where everybody here was very, very young. And um, I think we were at a, uh, in certain way, a little bit naive and not in the bad way. I think this case and the implications of that this case brought about needed to be a little bit, for us to be a little bit naive in order to do what was needed to be done at that point in time. Um, and also watching it now, 20 years later, and uh, the approach being so current, capturing the essence of the book and the book capturing the essence of how power is structured in my country, it was just great. And um, I am very grateful that the message of Monsignor Gerardi is going to be global now. So it's that's really, really good. And Fr Frank, tell us what it was like to experience when you first showed up in Guatemala and, and, and while they're investing in the case, what was that um, like? that time like to experience as a as an observer oh my god it was um you know it it was really an incredible feeling to reimburse myself in guatemala back then i'll never forget it because i had lived in guatemala in the 80s as a very young freelance journalist and working on my first novel and living that experience but never without you know i can't say i'm proud of any piece of journalism i did back there in my you know, beginning days, but I experienced very closely uh, the, 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 the incredible terror of that time and the tragedy of that time and the suffering of that time before I was really able to, to uh, you know, be able to do anything, even as a journalist. Uh, it, did, you know, it took me years to write the novel. 
And when I went back after those 10 years, you know, originally I had taken this assignment because I had been in Spain and I had seen the headlines on the newspaper saying um, that it was dog bites and Mario and Orantes and all that. And, you know, the father was guilty and it had been a gay crime. And it sounded like some crazy Almodovar movie, right? <laughs> you know, and, and that's what had made me think this will be an interesting thing to write about because it's so unexpected. But when I got to Guatemala, after talking to a few people, very quickly I realized what was going on. I realized that this was, you know, obviously a very complex theatrical political crime. And I remember it was like traveling back in time to that feeling of fear, paranoia. And it was just so dense. It was amazing. And I got, and, and uh, when I finally, um, I'll never forget the first experience, you know, the first reporting I did when it was going to be, you know, 10, nine years of reporting was hooking up with Fernando Penados and, and, and uh, Rodrigo and Arturo. And as you re remember, Arturo, that was a really terrifying, tense time because everybody was looking for the taxi driver. And we were driving around the city trying to find this taxi driver based on a lead they'd gotten from a priest. And somebody else was looking for the taxi driver. Dead taxi drivers were turning up all over the city, right? In fact, they thought that the taxi driver they were looking for had been killed already. And I, I remember that day when one of the first counters finally Fernando had with the taxi driver. Do you remember under Tudor, we were sitting in, outside some fast food parking lot in the Jeep while Fernando went in to have his first meeting with the taxi driver, which was the first big turn in the case, right? And then I'll never, you know, so it, there's where this, I was just so hooked on this story, the human element of this story, the drama of the story. And of course, meeting Claudia, three years later, I met Claudia at the trial in 2001. And, and, and you know, our, our movie focuses on those first three years that led to the trial, but of course decisive. But all those years that came after the trial were just as dramatic and just as complex. And, 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 and Claudia and I became, well, partners in this obsession. I'll, 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 tre I'll treasure forever the memories of going every evening to the newspaper where she worked, El Periodico, we would just sit around and analyze the case and break down the case and try to figure out what's going on. And we'd go out and look for witnesses together. Uh, you know, we'd spend weeks trying to find a witness and in the end, there was nothing, right? But that, it, it, we couldn't find Chesperito, for example, we couldn't find them. But even that searching was such a learning experience, it was just like, you know, sinking deeper and deeper into the, incredibly complex rea dramatic re reality of this case you know so uh great and then just um let's talk about this information for a second and first frank but and then i'll go to the to your other guys as well the i love frank how you talk about this case as an act of theater um and the theatrical nature of it um can you tell us what you mean by that and and talk let's, and talk about disinformation in, in this case. I mean, you have to think of, the thing that amazed me for those nine years that we were covering the case, we were always going back to the parish house garage where the murder happened, right? And discovering new things about it, new witnesses, new shadings of it. It was like a stage set, right? And so much, it was, it, so much was scripted from that first night on. Because like I always say, you know, when Virginia Woolf talks about a room of one's own being necessary for a, 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 you know, a woman artist to have the freedom to create, that's what the institution of impunity does for state murderers. When you're a state murderer and you know that no matter what you do, nobody's going to come after you. You're not going to have police investigating you. You're not going to have end up in court. You're not going to end up in jail, which is what they believed. Because military officers have never been sent to prison for this kind of crime before. That gives you the freedom to imagine a murder that's going to do much more than just eliminate the person you want to get rid of, in this case, Bishop Harardi. Right? It's going to allow you to send all kinds of messages out into the society, messages that the people those messages are intended for are going to understand, even if the rest of the society doesn't get it. It allows you to set up, rig up the crime in such a way 
And so like one fake scenario after another, you'll be able to plug in there and just create total confusion. Uh, it was a masterpiece of, 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 of deception and theatrical deception in that way. The one thing they just never expected, they never expected that this group of young people from the church, uh, Los Intocables, Arturo, Fernando, Rodrigo, and the, the lawyers working at the, you know, the people from the Church Human Rights Office, were going to be able to gather the evidence they gathered. That was the one thing the authors of this crime never foresaw. And Arturo, at the time, did you have this sense when you're investigating um, the case that there was this, like, like Frank says, this theatrical nature or that things were being planned to be seen or planted or, or for the purposes of spectacle? Did you have that sense while you're investigating that there was design in this? Oh, for sure. Um... Monsignor Gerardi was the most prominent bishop in the Catholic Church, and he was the murder um, of the Catholic Church on their engagement on the peace process. And he was extremely active, and he was a global voice. He uh, went to the General Assembly of the, of, uh, of the UN, for example, to speak about the peace process, to speak about human rights, to speak about human rights violations that were happening in the past in my country and in by that time in the present in my country. Um, so killing, murdering Monsignor Gerardi, of course, it was going to be, as Paco captured, a political murder. And a political murder has less to do with the actual death of a person and a lot to do with the consequences that you expect that murder brings about, right? For once, the priest process in my country recently signed a year earlier was never the same uh, after the death of Monsignor Gerardi, and that's big to say. And the engagement of the Catholic Church in social issues was never the same, right? There was a moment where fear struck um, our society, um, and it brought, brought us back 20 years to the 80s, right? as things were resolved and in, in, in those times in my country. Um, and then the way the, the elite, the status quo tried to cover up this murder and the sophistication in the cover, in the, in the cover up narratives, because there were several, there were not one, was impressive. And then you start studying more, doing more research, and you and, and, and we got to a place that it was pretty clear that the um, sophistication and the training that several um, members of the status quo got during the years of the war was put into place, trying to gain impunity in this, in this case. Uh, as Francisco mentions, yes, it was pretty sophisticated and you can see it happening like, yes, like in a play, like in a, in a theater, um, how this, the, the status quo using the state apparatus was trying to manipulate not only the narrative of the story, but how people perceived it, how Guatemalans and how the international co uh, community perceived what was happening in Guatemala. I agree uh, that uh, what, what Paco said, um, they didn't count it that the newer generations were not as afraid as the old guard um, because we were politically born in times of peace, right? So our experience was different. And as the three of us, there were a lot of more people that put their lives into risk in order for this case to be brought to justice. Mm-hmm. And, and Claudia, as a journalist, um, there was so much disinformation in the news um, around this case, and, and you were one of a minority of journalists who were determined to report the truth. And, and, and um, why was that important to you? And what was that like um, trying to work in that environment where there was so much disinformation and, and trying to find and report the truth? It's difficult because uh, you hear people that says things and 
you ask yourself, does that person really believe what he say, or is that person saying that because he must say that? Um, we interview Otto Ardon 22 years after the crime, and he, mm -hmm. he still believes and he still defends the theory of the dog bites. So as a journalist, you uh, hear people like him and you get confused. Come on, I, I, I speaking honestly, you get confused. But I think it's within the years, and that's what I mean when, when I say that looking back and looking at the case now, um, I will say to my younger version, report more. Go mm -hmm. out, report more. That solves everything. Go and report and uh, do your job. I mean, go to the street, uh, look up for the witnesses, go to the street and look up for Chespirito, uh, go to the park and try to find more people. And uh, as an editor, I repeat that to young reporters now. When they come and say, I'm a little bit confused because this person says something and this other says the opposite and both of them look really convinced. I just said, report, report more. Go to the street and find people. And once you're clear, I mean, everybody is going to be clear on, on, on the facts. Um, of course, saying this is easy, but doing it, especially in a country like this, is not as easy. I mean, you might, uh, you might find people, but people don't want to talk. And people don't want to talk just not because they don't want to, but because they fear talking. And you report in a place where the truth is a treasure. It's the treasure we were all looking for. But at the same time, speaking the truth for many people here, in this case, meant a sentence, a sentence of death. So it's not easy, it's difficult, but I believe it's the, the one of the greatest lessons of this case is that there is no, there is not such a thing as a perfect crime. There is not. I mean, you just need uh, investigators who are committed to their job and you need judges committed to the truth and justice. And then it will cost but you'll get, you know, to see the truth and and get justice for it. Of course, partially, and I think we all here agree that uh, it's just a portion of it. But it um, it was a beginning, and it is good to call it like that. Partially, but it was the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I mean, one of the things you talk about with the, the, the danger, let's talk about the danger for a second. It was a really dangerous case um, to be involved in, a, a dangerous investigation. Arturo, what was it like, especially as you were getting closer and closer to the truth and this, the stakes were getting higher, it was becoming, a, it was a really dangerous time for everyone involved. What was it like living through that and what kept you going? What was it that drove you to keep going? Because a lot of people went into exile and a lot of people um, stepped away. Um, yeah. You can, at that point in time, well, Guatemalan society was different than it is today. Um, and we were closer to the end of the war uh, in our country. So, um, the presence of uh, the um, actors, the, the violent actors during the war was, was, was still very present, very clear. Uh, so as we move forward and we encounter more and more evidence and then the theory of the case started to come together, of course, you, we started to touch on, on some very sensitive nerves, uh, not only regarding the actual uh, material perpetrators, but of course the people who that thought about the consequences that doing a political murder like that would brought about in our society and the political processes that it would set off, right? Undermining the peace process, undermining the, the construction of a more open and inclusive 
democracy in, in, in our country. So um, we started to, well, of course, get threats, be followed. Um, a, a, a good friend of mine, a very, very close friend of mine, Rodrigo, got a, a horrible death threat in, uh, by phone to his, to his home, to his house. Um, and uh, the, the, the presence uh, was, was they, these guys, the ones that are, are enemies of the truth, that are enemies of an open democracy, they, if they want, they can be invisible. And on the other hand, if they want, they can be very present in your life and, and just for you to feel it. And that was the, 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 that moment, that moment felt like that. Uh, every, every time we went and tried to find more evidence, do a diligence, whatever, you felt it, right? And uh, what kept us going, um, actually, it, it, was, it is not only the memory of Monsignor Gerardi, of course, that's extremely important, but again, the case became a symbol of what, what of the future of my country. Do we stand again in fear and let these people bring us back 20 years to the 80s? Or do we take a step forward and move to the next century, right? To the next century politically and, and, and by using, using in a good sense, this case to show that things are different and can be different in this country, right? And just remove a veil to that impunity, that, that wall of impunity that has kept uh, Guatemala under the boot for so, so, so many years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Francisco, what, I, mean, I love the way, well, let's talk about why it's so important that um, justice is found in a case like this. Um, and this, I mean, for me, this is one of the things that makes it relevant um, outside of Guatemala too, and to um, um, people living all over the world. Um, but why, uh, the, the way, and, and also the way it takes human beings to fight for and, and uphold justice. And, and, and tell us about that, because I, I love the way you talk about that. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, the big discovery for me in writing this book and why writing this book was in many ways, uh, you know, in many ways, almost like writing a novel, right? Was, you know, you, you say these phrases like the fight for justice, you know, and the fight against impunity and, and you know, the struggle to open up democratic spaces in a society where they've, so for, they've been, you know, closed for so long. All of that sounds, you know, like a kind of familiar, almost political science talk or something like that, right? And what I realized when I was working on this case and what just fascinated me from the start is that all of these things uh, you know, whatever theoretical framework you can give them, uh, they're all done by human beings. No, I mean, I mean, everything from, you know, from, from, you know, investigating a case, from committing a crime, from pla pla planning a crime, uh, from deciding that what you want to do is be a judge and try to uphold justice or be a prosecutor and fight for justice in a society where so many prosecutors and justices uh, in the end don't have the courage or the character to live up to the ideal of what their profession implies, right? What, what this case was really a study of was the people who did find it in themselves to come through and come together and do those things. It was such a human story. And, and, and not just in the sense of, you know, the wonderful people who did such heroic work, but so fast that we're, you know, we had incredible villains in this case. The villains were people you could contemplate and think about and try to understand forever. They were, they, they, we, Captain Byron Lima, uh, extraordinary character. You could, you know, it, it, right, out, you know, and then witnesses like Ruben Shanax, right? Such an enigmatical, kind of brilliant, uh, uh, um, you know, figure who steps out of the shadows and becomes so decisive in the case and whose psychology and motivation behind everything he does was just so completely intriguing and that you had to decipher and had to understand if you were going to be able to finally decide how credible he was. 
right? So it's just fascinating, you know, you know, completely fascinating figures. And uh, uh, and also, like, you know, I think it's so important to realize, too, that the case, you know, as, as Arturo was just saying, it was a case about um, whether Guatemala was going to take the next step forward into the next century or stay, you know, trapped in its, in its, in its, in its oppressive darkness. And it's really important to understand that, that that hasn't been resolved. That fight is still going on very much in those terms, right? And, and justice plays such a key part in it. And justice is not an abstraction. Justice is so necessary to moving forward democratically, just in the sense that if you think of um, you know, when, when criminal powers, violent repressive powers, are able to exert control over basic democratic institutions like the Justice Department, right? The public ministry. When they can do that, they're closing down a very important part of a democracy that a democracy needs to function, right? And if they can, if they can choke off a country's justice system, then they can also cr uh, choke off its democratic party system because if parties can then act criminally right to like so, so political parties are going to be basically in the control criminal uh you can't fight against that if your justice department is also in the control of criminals and so that's where these cases really become it completely necessary for be, creating the space in which democracy can exist mm -hmm. and, and and claudia tell us what's going on in Guatemala right now with the protests and, uh, against corruption that are happening. And it feels in a way like Guatemala's, uh, these issues are coming to a head. And, and how is that related to the Harari case? Well, when Arturo was talking and Frank uh, were explaining what the Herati case meant and what uh, having an independent justice system means, um, I'm going to take Arturo's word. If the question, then in 1998, in 2001, was, are we going to move forward? So then we're maybe in the next chapter, we're maybe saying the next chapter is too much, we're in the next page. Taking those kind of decisions as well, as Frank said, that uh, if they can take political parties and if they can take the judicial system, then what kind of democracy are we living in? If we can call it a democracy, you know? Uh, lately, I find it a little bit um, unfair to say that democracy here doesn't function. And I had to say, have we reached the level of democracy to say that it doesn't function? Because I cannot call that democracy. I cannot call that, uh, you know, when your judicial system is, you know, taken by, by criminals, a real democracy. So it's unfair to say it doesn't work here when we have not leave plenty of it. This is what we're living right now. People is aware of corruption. And I guess the next chapter or the next phase or to move forward was that exactly. After the head of the case, we have had many of cases in front of our face, in front of our eyes. We have uh, independent media that every day here publish how uh, robbers, ladrones, that's the word that I have to use, you know, get, a, get, a, get away with it. And, uh, you know, people is, you know, getting sick of it or fed of it. So that's why we're seeing all these demonstrations. Uh, we were asking the other day if they're going to stay here forever. And my guess is that we don't have to think of demonstrations as you know what we see in the plaza it's the attitude it's the citizens knowing the truth and the attitude that they take after knowing the truth i mean if you know corruption or if they reject it i'm happy to say that uh, every time i see that guatemalans are more aware of it and they are they show that character you know to to say it, enough is enough um but it doesn't change from one day to another and it's a whole process 
we're in the middle of that process. And I wouldn't say that the hierarchy case, you know, is away or is isolated. I begin, you know, this era or this, uh, this time began with that case. That's the milestone. Mm -hmm. And uh, Arturo, you, um, you live in the, in the States. Um, how, um, how is what happened, uh, how, are the, how is it the US related to what happened to this in terms of, uh, in what's been going on in Guatemala in terms of um, uh, the support of Joe Biden, um, Trump, what we've had over the last four years with Donald Trump, and then what do you see um, for the future with Joe Biden's pres presidency in January for Guatemala? Um, I must say that for good or for worse, um, my country is still uh, under the influence of, of, of well, one of the biggest countries in the world. And that's in geopolitics, well, basically natural. Um, I'm not going to say if it's good or, or if it's bad. It is what it is, right? Um, on the other hand, that influence can be positive or that influence can be negative. Um, the way I see it, uh, there is a balance of power in every society. And uh, the balance of power in my country um, was altered in the past four years. Um, you had in one hand the 1%, the former military, the military, the political class. And on the other hand, you had uh, the international community, the journalists, the academia, civil society, human rights defenders, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, some members of the international community uh, choose a side um, over the past four years, and that just put tremendous political weight on one side of the scale, and, um, and that side choose that uh, some justice was okay, but a lot of justice was not, and that, uh, and, and the criminal justice system and the fight against impunity in my country paid a high price. The balance of power was altered. So the majorities, indigenous communities, um, journalists, universities, academia, the civil society, all of these guys, they're the majorities, but they don't carry a lot of political weight, right? And those guys were left alone. Uh, so my guess and my hope, given the history of the past 12 years and the interest that um, President elect Biden has showed in the past for my region and in my country, for example, um, he's the most senior official that has traveled the most times during his tenure to Central America, 16 times, I think. And that's a lot for Vice President of the United States to travel to this beautiful and, and, and so much potential but small region like mine and my country, I'm being clear. So I see that there is potential for this balance of power to be restored. And, and I have to agree completely with the analysis of Claudia and Francisco. The fight against impunity, the fight against corruption, it's in the center of everything. If you unlocked that level, you can unlock the rest of the levels. And I'm gonna explain why. The, the justice system is like the referee of a society. If the referee and the game is rigged, then you cannot expect all the players to feel comfortable enough to follow the rules, right? And then some players are just going to have their way and they're just gonna impose their interest over the interest of the nation, of society. If you build a strong immuno immunological system by building a strong justice system, then you build trust. And then you build a, a democratic game where everyone will play by the rules. And that just fosters development and, 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 and abiding by the law and, and just uh, watching a country, a society, just bloom, just bloom. And I do believe that we have a chance now uh, to be able to restore some of that. It will take time, 
Mm -hmm. For sure, it will take time. But I think once again, we are at the beginning of the beginning. Mm -hmm. and, and Frank, on that note, what do you hope that people coming to this film um, fresh um, will take away from it? And particularly people in Guatemala, I mean, you observed the Harari case um, and this fight for justice that happened um, in Guatemala 20 years ago. And there's the fight that's going on today. What do you hope people that may come to this film and, and see this film take away from it and um, relate to their own fights for, for justice? Well, I, you know, I, uh, what I said, I, I hope that they see the film and realize that something extraordinary happened in Guatemala. That when we talk about something like, yes, we must defend justice, what do you really mean? We mean, you know, it means people stepping up. It means people taking risks. It means people working together. It means people, you know, having the right character and intelligence, and courage to do these things. And the movie shows that, right? So it should give us respect for the people who, who you know, in a, in a, you know, w w w it's it's so dangerous in any society when the rule of law comes under attack, as it's been so under attack in the United States. Right? Maybe we'll stop even and think if we're watching the United States. You know, these people who stood up. To Trump, or standing up to Trump, whether they're in the justice system, uh, whether they're in, in the electoral system, like this guy uh, Krebs, you know, they're showing courage, right? This is what defending democracy is. It, it doesn't come for free. It doesn't just fall from the sky. No, so I think that's part of it. I hope they just realize what it, you know, it's a, it, what, that it's a great story, but it's a great story that has uh, things that are just so relevant to all of us on this side of the hemisphere, right? Because a democracy is something, we used to think that, that the United States had democracy. It's how, I think now we realize from, from Chile up to the Northern border of the United States, democracy is threatened. It's something that needs to be fought for. Maybe Canada is in better shape. So, you know, it's, uh, uh, I think we're all in it together right now. I think we were talking the other day on the phone, Arturo and I, we agreed, you know, Guatemala could not have survived four more years of Trump. It's the Trump administration with its loathing of independent prosecutors. It's, you know, you know how the wicked witch, like when you throw water on her, she, sh she shrivels, right? That's how Trump is when he hears the words anti-corruption prosecutor, right? And so... He found an ally in Guatemala in the Trump mini-me, who was the president of Guatemala in those years, Morales. And he, they got away with doing in Guatemala what he couldn't quite get away with doing in the United States. The, the justice system was crushed in Guatemala the last four years. And four more years of that, I think, would have been fatal. You know? And I think now, like I agree with Arturo, we have, we have a chance. And I just hope that people who see the movie realize, you know, when you hear about these kinds of struggles in, in, in a country like Guatemala and elsewhere, these are the kind of people who are doing this sort of thing. I mean, so you see someone like the prosecutor Leopoldo Zaysi, right? Who, who had as a young 32 year old prosecutor uh, in a country where so many prosecutors don't have the courage and you can't blame them. It's so dangerous to, to, to do what is required of a prosecutor in a, in a critical instance. This young man at that point did. He stepped up and did it, right? And it's important to recognize he's still there. He's still in Guatemala, right? He's it's still in the newspapers, right? As he was just the other day, right? I, I noticed, that, you know, Claudia, who was the not just one of a few reporters who were trying to get the truth out about the Haredi case. I would say, from my experience, she was the only one. She was the only one. Part of it was the naivete of youth, as Arturo says. She was so young, you know, and, and, and couldn't be intimidated. And she didn't know enough to be intimidated really yet when she got going. Uh, uh, she's still there. She's still, you know, she's one of the most important journalists in Guatemala right now. It takes, you know, it, 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 it's, it's it, behind all these things that, you know, these phrases like independent press, okay, independent press. Behind that, you're talking about the extraordinary conviction and talents of individual people and groups of people. Yeah. And I think that's what they take away from it, you know, from this movie. Mm -hmm. I agree, absolutely. Definitely and, Sorry. So, Tari, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I was thinking about 
um, your question, uh, have I learned things differently than, have I learned things different from uh, the way that I learned them back in 2001? And I was totally uh, amazed. It really, I was surprised that I cried uh, when I was recalling uh, the, the episode of the bomb, the grenades in the house of Jasmine Barrios. Mm -hmm. And after we, we did that, after we filmed that, I kept on asking to myself, why did I cry? And why was, why was this moment so emotive for me? Then I realized that when I was, you know, 24, 20, 24, 25, I knew it was something really huge happening to her. But then when I saw the film, I thought she had the right to live. I mean, no one would have, you know, blamed her for living. Not only the kids, but the country. And then I thought about her. You can go right now to the courtroom where she works. And she's working with the same devotion there. Living in the same house and having, you know, in her courtroom, you know, huge cases. So that's where I learned revisiting the case. Things that when you're 22, 24, 25, you can, you can see, you know, how big they are, but maybe it takes time, you know, to have them in your mouth, to taste them, and then to have them in your body and to see that um, a lot of people here have conviction and a lot of people uh, do their job. And it's not about being brave, although you can call them brave. It's just a, a conviction of doing a job and doing it the way you are called to do it. Mm -hmm. It's really powerful. And um, Claudia, what, um, how do you think the film will be um, received in Guatemala? Well, there's a lot of action here, a lot of questions, people asking about uh, how uh, Guatemalans can see it and um, a lot of, you know, uh, curiosity about uh, where's the case is standing right now. And um, it is funny because we were talking about propaganda and all that theater. And you, you can still sense, you know, the, the, the shadows of that uh, theater, which was played with questions of people, you know, still with dots. So I, my hope is that uh, when they see the film, they, you know, they are going to solve a lot of questions and they will ask more and, and understand more facts that are happening now in front of our eyes. Mm -hmm. And um, Arturo, just to bring us to an end here, what's the one thing you would wish for Guatemala? Um, I would say, can I say two? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I would say um, on the one hand, to have a great independent referee. That's a strong um, justice system that could make everybody play by the rule with absolute independence that has to be built. And on the other hand, um, access to everybody, to the decision-making processes to everybody, indigenous communities, um, civil society, women, uh, young people, LGBT, LGBTQI community, everybody, just to have access to the decision-making processes so they can have a part on the construction of their future. That's the only way to build democracy. If a future is laid out for you in, in the 21st century, you won't identify with it. And it won't build a strong society, a strong community. And then that justice system to be able uh, to, to be as strong for everybody to play nice in a society, to have differences and those differences to be re recognized as 
diversity as the way to build a strong, creative, and vibrant society. That's what I wish for my country. So, Arturo, what are some of the biggest updates in the case um, since the the trial um, and and where the film ends off? Uh, well, actually, well, we got the, the 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 Supreme Court of Justice to help the conviction, and uh, that conviction had a piece written in it by the tribunal that uh, um, mandated the. Um, prosecutors to continue the investigation to find out who the intellectual authors of this political crime were. So there's still a group of, of people uh, doing investigations, of course, not with the, with the drive or the momentum of that point in time, but still very committed uh, uh, persons led by Jorge Garcia uh, that are doing investigations. I think this, um, this case is so deep in its political rooting that this is like a living document. In some way, it will never end. And in some way, it will continue to teach us lessons, um, judicial lessons, but also political lessons uh, to our country. And, and Frank, just picking up on that, can you tell us about what happened with CSIG um, that grew out of the Herodi case and um, the role that it played in Guatemala, and then what's happened most recently. Well, you know, Arturo worked for CC, but uh, 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 CC was uh, a phenomenally successful anti-corruption, anti-impunity effort that really grew out of the Herodic case. Because one of the lessons of the Herodic case was that it, it's, uh, you can have a group of dedicated young prosecutors get some international support because it's in a place in a country like Guatemala these institutions are very weak right and so you had you know the U.S. had, had suddenly changed its foreign policy when the U.S. realized you know, when the Cold War ended the CIA sort of withdrew its interest from Guatemala and the military looked around and said how are we going to hold on to real power and they realized uh, alliances with organized crime were going to be even more profitable than CIA largesse and U.S. government largesse had ever been. So uh, in, in the aftermath of the Harari case especially, at Deering even, the U.S. had realized that, you know, to keep, you know we're going to have to, the sort of achieving of justice is going to be sort of the line in the sand. It's going to sort of keep, Guata, you know, it's going to be the only place where you can keep Guatemala from falling into becoming a criminal narco state, basically, right? So even early on in the Harari case, you would see gestures of U.S. report, support for the prosecution in that case that you'd never seen before in Guatemala. And we also had a United Nations peacekeeping mission in Guatemala at that time, in the aftermath of the war. And they were very involved and they helped to investigate the case in some really important ways. And just their presence gave Protection. Because you can be sure if they hadn't been there, I don't think the case could have gone forward. They would have killed people. No, more people than they, you know, it, it, it. and so out of those lessons, they realized that we're going to, you know, if, if you're going to fight transnational crime, narco crime, international organized crime, and its influence in Guatemala, uh, you need an international organization. And so you had this commission uh, uh, funded by the UN and by the United States, where you had international prosecutors working with Guatemalan prosecutors in the Guatemalan uh, justice ministry to pursue cases. It got off, started in 207, 206, 207. It got off to a rocky start. They had some successes, some controversial cases. They sometimes aimed in the wrong direction. Uh, but finally, when Ivan Velasquez, this very famous Colombian prosecutor, uh, a jurist took over in 2013 as and began to work with two incredible attorney generals in succession, uh, Claudia Pasi Pasi, Thelma Aldana, they began to have extraordinary successes uh, uh, in terms of beginning to, you know, uh, uh, build up the Justice Department in Guatemala and its real successes against organized crime. Perez Molina in prison. He went from the presidency to prison in one day, right? And that was a glorious moment for Guatemala. 
justicia uh, uh, biosis between aggressive justice department prosecution investigation and the support of the people out in the plazas that made it possible for him to hide behind his immunity and it was a, a great victory you know and uh and so it, it has become a model and this is what uh jim morales in the last four years and trump really shut down and drove from the country and turned the country it's not an exaggeration right claudia to say they gave the country back to the organized crime yeah yeah and, and everybody uses the word captive now the guatemalan institutions are currently captive by organized crime because of what Morales and Trump did. And so that's why I also say four more years of this would have been, uh, you know, just too much. And there's a, and the Biden, the Biden uh, plan for Central America, which I just spoke to just the other day, I had a long telephone conversation with, uh, with, with, with uh, Ivan Velasquez, the assistant commissioner, the former assistant commissioner, and he was very hopeful about it. And I, one of the many things that, that Biden says he's going to do is create a commission where where the public ministries, the justice departments of Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala, for example, will collaborate. Right? And he's talking about putting in the U.S. embassies offices of the Treasury Department to track money laundering and of the Justice Department to support and work directly with Justice Departments in Guatemala and in those countries. You know, so there he's Biden is trying to kind of recreate CC in a way, in a different way, a more local way, but the same idea of international cooperation. Uh, so that's a hopeful thing, right? So so uh, um, we'll see what happens, right? As, as it'll, take, it'll take some time, but I think you're going to see a change in Guatemala. We have a chance for one now. Mm -hmm. And, and Arturo, you, you worked for CSIG, as, as Frank says, and you continued to investigate the Harari case. And am I right in thinking that you've been involved in three separate investigations in Captain Lima um, as well? Can you tell us um, about what's happened? What happened to, I mean, because obviously Captain Lima, uh, there's been no update, there was no updates in the um, film about what's happened to Captain Lima in the years since. And can you, is there anything you can tell us about the, um, the case itself? Um, that brings it more up to date. Um, regarding the Gerardi case, the people that get convicted um, serve their terms in prison. Um, and yes, regarding Capitan Lima, um, when I was uh, Secretary of Strategic Affairs of Attorney General Claudia Pasipas, um, one of the um, prosecutor's offices that deals with the crimes committed in jail brought information to the attention of the attorney general that Capitan Lima um, had a lot of privileges inside of the jail and that, that he went out of jail as it, it was his house. So he conducted his business. He had restaurants, he had a couple of bars, beauty parlors outside of the jail. So he conducted his business during the daytime, back to sleep and out again. Um, so a case was developed regarding those crimes. And afterwards, um, I started working for CSIG in, in January of 2014, and um, a case uh, was uh, developed. Um, and it was a, ga a case that um, was trying to investigate the prison's bureau, actually, in, in Guatemala. And when investigating that case, it turned out that the de facto director of the entire National Prisons Bureau in Guatemala was Capitan Lima. Um, so a case was developed and um, the investigation led to the information that it was a parallel structure in the Prisons Bureau. You had the formal director, uh, deputy director, the director of logistics, the director of intelligence, uh, everything inside the prison bureau, and then you had Capitan Lima and his associates in a parallel structure, deciding who went where uh, in, in terms of the prisons, because of course you have VIP prisons and you have hell holes in my country in, inside the prison bureau systems. And um, deciding that and deciding who went where and, and deciding who was uh, to be um, leaders, let's call it that, leaders inside, inside the prison bureau system. 
So a case was developed and um, it was brought forward on September of 2014. It was a big case. The entire chain of command of the prison bureau systems in, in Guatemala was uh, arrested and was prosecuted. And that case, uh, several of them has been convicted since then. Um, Capitan Lima was of course prosecuted for those crimes as well. And uh, he stayed in, in jail, of course. And during that time, um, he got in trouble with another inmate, a very powerful narco trafficker who was in jail for the murder of 16 people. Um, I believe so, 16 or 19 people that were in the bus and that supposedly was hiding some drugs inside of it. He and his um, drug trafficking organization were looking for the drugs. They didn't find the drugs and they killed everybody inside of that bus and they burned it, right? Uh, so he was serving basically life. There's no life terms uh, in, in my country, but he was serving consecutive um, uh, uh, sentences for those murders. So they got into a dispute as to what, to whom was to be the leader and the boss inside of the prison system in my country. And this person um, who's being prosecuted for that murder as well, um, decided that he wanted to be the boss and move against Capitan Lima. So Capitan Lima was killed inside one of the biggest prisons in Guatemala in the year 2018, if I recall correctly. Yes. Thank you. And um, Claudia, there's a lot going on in Guatemala right now that parallels the case. Um, can you tell us what those parallels are? Well, um, quest of justice. This is a country where you are looking for justice every day. All kinds of justice, believe me, it's not only a matter of criminal justice, but uh, social justice. And I guess uh, this is a never ending story and it should never end. Uh, I mean, you, sometimes we tend to think that these are the problems of uh, undeveloped or third world countries. But I think this is a quest uh, that um, belongs to the world, whatever you are. Um, I will say that's the big parallel of the Gerardi case with the, the story of, 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 you know, Guatemala these days. And um, se fue, verdad? Oh, no. Okay, so. And just very quickly, what the what the protests are about in Guatemala right now, for someone that doesn't doesn't know. Uh, the protest in Guatemala is against corruption. Uh, people is getting tired. Um, the government here is trying to explain that people is, you know, tired of the pandemic. Uh, but I think that's just an excuse. Of course, we're, you know, uh, we have the right to demand, you know, the proper answers from the government um in terms of keeping us safe from a pandemic and that's here and everywhere but uh, people is tired of realizing that even though that we're suffering from this you know um health um emergency um a new government just um, came in and they are doing exactly the same vices that the partido patriota did um that thing that Arturo just explained uh, about giving you know the prisons administrations to someone we just found out that the same I mean exactly the same practice of giving an institution you know to a person who has supported you is happening right now you know President Jamate is giving institutions to his allies political allies or persons who you know gave money to his campaign so what do you get after that? I mean, you don't get institutions. You just get, you know, uh, buildings full of people who's getting money or pay for money uh, for doing nothing or for doing things that they are not qualified to. That is what is happening here in Guatemala. And then I, th I think you have a question for me. Oh, yes, I have a question. You were, you asked me what's the expectation of Guatemalans 
and the film and i had to tell you i mean it's this is the question that uh, people has been asking why of all stories of crimes in the world i mean you came here you read the book and you say this is the the film that i want to do i mean mm -hmm. you must have 10 um 20 maybe so what brought you here what brought you to this case Well, I think it's a testament to Frank's book. I mean, um, Teddy Lee, for the producer of the film from Rice Films, he um, optioned Frank's book and and sent me a copy and said um, he he wanted to talk about turning it into a documentary film. Um, and I read the book, and it was only about 20 pages in. It was really really quick that um, I, I was I was taken, and so I called Teddy back and I said I'm really interested um, and I'd love to be involved. And I think it's it was as Frank's saying, it was like The, the the human side of the book and I could see how it, on the surface it looks like it's a story that's just um, about a, a case in Guatemala but there were so many things that were universal about it that I felt like um, would be relevant to audiences everywhere and the importance of a strong judiciary in a democracy and and the courage that everyone showed I mean it was very moving reading Frank's book and, and hearing about the risks that people were willing to take um, For this belief that they had and so i was very moved by it as well and so it, it, it i i would say the answer is that it was frank's wonderful uh um uh, writing and in, and in, in in his novel and i'm and i'm very glad that that it all happened well um i hope that as people start to see this film um you all get the recognition um that you deserve for the incredible work you've done um Um, Frank, for your dedication writing the book and 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 seeing that through over nine years, Arturo, um, for the courage that you showed in, in investigating the case and and the principles that you that you um, stand by, and and Claudia, um, your determination and and to find the truth and 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 um, you embody those principles as well. Um, and so I think um, Bishop Harari lives on in, in the work that you all do. And that you, the, the principles that you stand for, um, and so um, I hope that people recognize that, and um, and you get the um, the appreciation that you deserve. Um, so that concludes our, our our chat. Thank you so much for joining us and talking so eloquently about the case. Um, and so, if you haven't already, um, uh, please tune in to the Art of Political Murder on HBO Max, um, and uh, we hope you enjoy the film. <laughs>